So, let me be honest. Tears of the Kingdom speedruns have some issues. Any percent runs, where you beat the game as fast as possible, start with a really precise clip out of the level right away, which is cool. The problem is that right after you're done maneuvering through the level, you come up to this cutscene. Oh wait, not, not this one. This one. Was that the sword that seals the darkness? This cutscene is 3 minutes and 55 seconds long and unskippable. Some runners, me included, have even started playing other games during this cutscene just to kill the time during our attempts. Now, this would maybe be acceptable. If not after this cutscene, runners would have to do literally one of the most precise jumps in the whole run. This jump is so precise that Timber, a fellow Tears of the Kingdom runner and Glitch Hunter, made a whole video about it. So if you finally get here, but you mess up this jump, you are going back to intro jail. This can make any percent runs pretty grindy and frustrating, and if that wasn't enough of an issue, we also have the multiple different versions the game can be run on that are not easy to access for some people, the strange cutscene heavy pacing at the start that makes it seem like Nintendo intentionally wanted to mess with speedrunners, or even the fact that you don't even get the paraglider right after the tutorial this time. But that's not why you're here, and that's not what this video is about. This video is all about the cool new tricks that have been discovered recently, that actually despite all this are slowly transforming the run into something really cool. I'm here to break down all the tricks any percent speedrunners do right now to be in Tears of the Kingdom in under 40 minutes soon. Let's go! So the first trick that runners do is the intro clip. Now why is it called the intro clip? It's because we're going to be clipping out of bounds to skip parts of the intro. I remember first playing this game and really being intrigued by the story when heading down this section, but literally if you go to my VODs channel, LimCube VODs by the way, you can already hear me talk about the fact that we will likely have to play this intro every single time we play the game and it was something that we always dreaded. Now, I never thought that before the game is even a year old we have a way to save time here and that is the intro clip. We're going to be clipping out of bounds here, I will explain how runners do this first. Essentially by jumping onto this pillar and moving Link basically to a very specific position by looking at his right hand. Most runners look at specific dots on the wall there and it can be quite the complicated process to get him to the right spot and then you basically hope that the position is correct and an express will get you out of bounds. Let's see if I did it here. I did. And uh, if you watch for example player 5 do runs, he will literally reset until he gets this clip quickly and first try because it will save a lot of time if you don't waste time on the wall trying to get out of bounds. Now the question is why are runners going out of bounds? Look at this. What is even going on here? First of all, it's probably interesting to note that this level is not on the main map of Tears of the Kingdom. It's kind of in its own map. You can think of this as a shrine. You can also kind of see that the staircase leading back kind of just abruptly ends. So there's nothing left here. There's nothing to the right, nothing up top, nothing below. You can actually explore these areas with a little bit of glitching, but it doesn't matter. So why even clip out of bounds? Normally, when you play through this intersection, Zelda interrupts you at many different positions. The first position would be right about like here. This is when she kind of talks to you about the gloom. You can actually see her on the bottom there walking forward about the gloom having attacked Hyrule Castle. And I'm going to try to do, in my opinion, the hardest part about this trick called the first cutscene skip. So once you're out of bounds, you want to go for something like this. And unfortunately, I missed it here, which is actually a good showcase of what happens when you do miss it. Uh, Zelda will activate the cutscene and pull you back in bounds. This is obviously normally what you not want to happen. So let me do the clip again and then show you a successful way as to how the cutscene is actually skipped. Now here I successfully jumped past the cutscene trigger using something called a moss door slash. You will see these slashes all across the early game of the run. They basically allow you to jump a little bit further by turning Link around during a jump slash and holding the opposite direction. Next jump I'm going to do will be a chain of moss door slashes as well, so you can kind of see what that looks like. This is the second cutscene skip. Normally at this corner, uh, the master sword would glow up and interrupt you, but what you can do instead is basically do these backflips, followed by one, two, and three moss door slashes to land on this section out of bounds. If you're too far to the left, the cutscene will trigger. If you're not far enough, you will fall down. From here, you can climb up the wall and then side hop up left, 
and side hop, uh, basically jump up to make it on top of this ceiling. Now, here is normally a section where Zelda interrupts you three times in this Zonai architecture section because she nerds out about all of the architecture that she's finding here. But we will skip those as well by walking up to this ledge, climbing down, climbing down a little bit more and then side hopping to the left five times. One, two, three, four, five. And then a final time up left. This will basically skip all of these text triggers for the one here between these two statues. We are actually high up enough that the cutscene doesn't trigger. And in this next section, we're just going to be walking over this room with the keys where Zelda finds the murals of the imprisoning war and completely skip them. Walk up to this pillar. And the last thing that's left to do is actually reach the main cutscene back there where Zelda and Link discover Ganondorf. Now, as I already teased, that cutscene is still not skippable, but we are going to be jumping there straight away and if you do all of this out of bounds movement correctly this entire intro clip section can save up to a minute but once again we're going to make use of these monster slashes by turning around and then doing a bunch of them in a row while kind of holding back and left until we reach the intro beginning of the game all that's left to do is basically press a and b at the same time to match through the text and make sure that the cutscene begins and then here is our beloved three minute 55 second cutscene that i have seen like a hundred times so i'm gonna get some coffee right now um and i'm gonna skip it for you as well so we can talk about the next trick now, after the intro section, you obviously arrive in the Room of Awakening with the Decayed Master Sword. And I won't waste too much time talking about CSS or Cog Skip Skip. Timber made an entire video about why this is probably one of the hardest tricks in the speedrun. I will show you how it's done and I will explain you why we do it. So there's two things we achieve with this trick. We can skip activating this first Zonai device and turning the wheels on on the left, which actually in the past was called cog skip, using these cogs to skip up to this room. And you will basically understand soon why. But we can skip this entirely with this jump, which already saves around 40 seconds. And we do definitely want to leave this room through the top. And the reason we want to do this is to pick up some Zonai wings, which I, when the game came out, completely underrated. I thought they were kind of cool, but not super useful. I, at this point, basically consider them the most useful Zonai device other than rockets in the game. And I will explain you why, at least in any percent. But for Cog Skip Skip, everyone kind of has their own setup. What really matters is that you jump really quickly. Uh, not really quickly, but you jump while Link is running quickly down this cog. And it is sometimes really difficult to do. Sometimes it can be you can have a streak where you get it first try a lot. The only problem is if you fail this a bunch, most of the time you will have to reset and go back to the start and have to watch the unskippable cutscene again. Uh, and especially if you watch top level attempts that can get a little bit frustrating. Basically, we um, move up this section here and make it into this section of the game. Some people will recognize this. This is where you normally head back to uh, discover the recall shrine. Not so, yeah, which currently is not active because we haven't activated the Temple of Time yet. In fact, and I can give you a little bit of lore here, none of the shrines in this game are active until you touch the door of the Temple of Time. Uh, and even if we were to find a way to clip inside these shrines, from our current knowledge, the loading zone inside them is not active. So we might not have the option to do any Breath of the Wild type skips where we clip into shrines. So why do we do this jump? Why do we come up here? Once again, by climbing up the wall here, there's a couple of things we can do. First of all, we try to to pick up some sticks like here um, there's a chance that these can actually i think there's a 60 percent chance or 50 percent chance that they can drop a tree branch we need at least a certain amount of weapons for a trick later in the run but the real star of the show is this chest right here containing three zonai wings and if you haven't um, known this by now most top speedruns to beat the game super fast are done on older versions of the game in my case in particular i am on version 1.0.0 that i have personally obtained by just buying the game physically and uh, factory resetting my switch so that the cartridge is still being played on its like default version which is version 1.0 and on this version, what you can do, uh, you can do super efficient item duping and it's even easier with Zona devices. Literally all you do is you take out Zona devices and you press Y and B kind of at the same time, Y like a little bit earlier, like a frame or two, and you will dupe them. Like I already have 12 Zona wings. I have like 22 right now, which is pretty much all you need for the run. And this allows us to kind of 
built in a super interesting route through the Great Sky Islands. And I'm kind of going to explain our goal here once, and then I'm going to show you a version, like a clip of this actually working out. Uh, because next up is, in my opinion, the hardest trick in the run, which makes the early game extremely difficult. I'm once again going to see if I can maybe get a stick. And this time I got one. Nice. I'm going to save the game here for this playthrough where I explain you all of the tricks, because having one stick will be nice. Although not needed, because I will show you another super optimal strat later that runners are just starting to implement. But our approach of going through the early game can be described as the floor is lava. The first shrine that we want to uh, basically enter is the ascent shrine, right? And the ascent shrine is over here. We could technically, if this entire open the temple of time door shenanigan wouldn't exist then we could technically fly there right now on a wing in a straight path but the problem is the shrine is closed the other problem is we don't have the pura pet yet in fact the pura pet is probably even a bigger problem because if you don't get if you don't grab the pura pets most of the great sky island will actually be taboo if you try and jump to those areas, the game will straight up void you out and put you back in your place. Additionally, currently, the intro cutscene is active, which makes it so that even more areas around here will be considered void out triggers. If I try to jump all the way back there, Link would just void out and spawn back up top here. Now, what we will do is a strategy called wing flip. And this is one of the most absurd strategies that you may have ever seen. We're going to jump into the intersection, and then as soon as the intersection ends, I'm going to perform a trick called wing flip. This will allow me to land on a wing straight out of the intersection, like the, the big title reveal, and I will land on this wing. I will then fly this wing to the parapet, where I will obtain the parapet while never touching the ground, and then continue by jumping off the wing onto another wing, and fly to the Temple of Time door that I will activate, activate while also standing on a wing. Now what this will do is it will allow us to jump off after having activated the door of the Temple of Time, which means that the shrines will now be active. I, we will intentionally jump off down into the void. The game will void link out and there will be basically a question that the game has. And that question is, where was the last point Link touched solid ground? And in our case, that last point will be all the way back there, where I just picked up the stick earlier, where um, we will jump into the intro cutscene. So after doing this, and you will see this in a second because I will show you a full section. After doing this very intricate movement, we will be placed all the way back up on the Room of Awakening, and then we can actually fly to uh, ascend in a straight line. We do another trick and then do our first shrine. Now, the entire reason that's so fast is because once we have completed ascent, we can literally fly to Fuse in a straight line, then do a trick to Ultra Hand in a straight line, go back to Temple of Time, walk back here, get Recall, and finish the Great Sky Island. So this entire insanely difficult movement, the jump up the wheel, the wing flip that I'm about to show you, and all of these shenanigans is all to make the GSI route as clean as possible, and that's currently our approach to it. Um, I'm gonna make a cut here because it might take me a couple attempts to get a good wing flip going, and then the second I do, I will go ahead and explain you how it works. Embarrassingly, this took me quite a long time to record, but to be fair, this is one of the hardest tricks that I've ever learned at any speedrun. This will be good enough for me to explain you how the trick works. So as you can see, you start up in the normal Tears of the Kingdom intro cutscene, like the second one, I guess, the one where the title is revealed, and this is what makes this trick so hard as well. Because if you fail this trick, you can only do it by reloading the save file on, on top of the Room of Awakening. And essentially, if you fail this trick in any real speedrun, you can't even do the route. The entire route is basically built around doing this floor is lava movement. Now let's get to the actual trick. Once the title has been revealed, you start by diving down. And then after a specific timing in the music, I spawn a Zonai wing do a jump attack because the wing was spawned during the dive, it flips, hence the name wing flip. Cancel the jump attack with a neutral dive, which will basically allow me to move closer to the wing and then cancel my dive by pressing B. This will make it so that Link will grab the wing. And this small little grab onto the flipped wing is what resets our fall damage here. 
What this allows us to do is to do another jump attack, another dive, spawn another wing, another jump attack, and then basically land on that spawned wing. It's also important that you're not too low here, otherwise you will trigger an additional um, auto save. So even if you do all of the things I do here, I would actually be put onto the staircase here instead of all the way back up at the Room of Awakening. Now, in my case here, I took another quarter heart of damage here because Link was ragdolling. So I'm only on one heart. The problem with being on one heart is you lose a little bit of time at the Temple of Time because instead of jumping down to the Void out, which does exactly one damage, you have to save and reload the game, which is perfectly valid, just a little bit slower. Uh, in top runs you'll see um, me or other runners take less damage here. I had to record all of this in one section so it, I didn't get the perfect clip. Now, um, what's really what, what the problem here is as well is because I was ragdolling, I didn't get really a great opportunity to control my wing because I'm going to be steering on this wing basically to land next to this construct. Ideally, you want to land on the wing right in front of the construct that gives you the Pura Pet. I had a little bit of an incident happen here as well. I kind of had to stack some wings up on top <laughs> to actually be able to communicate with him, which is fine because we get as many wings as we want. And then I interact with the construct giving me the Pura Pet. Now you'll see the cutscene will play a little bit weirdly. This is a one minute cutscene, so I'm going to skip through it. Link will be on top of the wing still during the cutscene. He will receive the Pura Pet. His fingers will kind of clip into it because the game isn't really sure what's happening right now. You get the Pura Pet, which now makes it so that you can actually play on the bottom half of the Great Sky Island without voiding out. Then once I obtain the Pura Pet and the cutscene finally ends, I place another wing on front of Link. I actually go for another wing here just to make sure that I can do the next strategy correctly, which we call a wing landing on a, uh, using a dive. Um, the way I do it here is by backflipping. Diving, I press the dive button here, the R button, spawning a wing, and then doing another one of those Mostor slashes to land on the wing, followed by immediately unequipping my weapon. And you'll see why. Because now we are approaching the Temple of Time, and in front of the Temple of Time there is a construct having uh, a sword and shield equipped, which is perfectly what we need. So we will actually um, just take it. So in runs, we fly towards this guy. I kind of steer the wing by positioning Link a little bit more forward. And then... Crash into the construct intentionally, picking up the sword and shield from it. An additional thing we do here is some pretty cool movement. By running towards the staircase and spawning a wing and then another one, we kind of use these wings to climb up the stairs, spawn another wing, jump, shield jump onto the wing. I almost have a pretty big incident here happen, thanks to stick drift by running a little bit too far to the right. If I touched the ground here, I would have done all of this for nothing. I reposition, run, spawn a wing, jump, spawn another wing and open the door at the Temple of Time. And now from this point, we've done the hard part of the trick. A small time save that runners do here is when the text cutscene, uh, the text box shows up how to control the Pura Pet, we just press minus to get control of Link uh, quicker again. And what I then do is I save the game and reload. Once again, because I'm too low, uh, if I didn't take as much damage during the wing flip, I could have just jumped off the Great Sky Island here. Um, let me jump to a good position. I could have just jumped off here. Right, right in front of me, I could have jumped off. I would have been put to the last position where Link touches the ground, but a save and a reload will accomplish the same thing. I save the game, I reload the save. On the save, Link's last saved position, you can already see it on the loading screen here, is right here, on top of the Room of Awakening, allowing us to now go through GSI super quickly with the Temple of Time activated and the Pura Pet acquired. And guess what, where Link spawns right on top of the Room of Awakening. Now, as you can see, there's a little bit of a difference. Now. The Ascent Shrine is actually open. You can see the green swirl around it. So, if this wasn't ridiculous enough yet, let's add another stupid strat. Uh, that saves around 3 seconds that top runners do. It's pretty cool though. We do a shield jump and immediately let go of ZL. Once Link puts away his shield, we spawn another wing and shield jump onto it. You can see how many ways there really are to basically jump on a wing and get some cool early game movement going, which is why I personally was so surprised how good wings are. You see this water pool below me? We could technically jump into this one and then ride another wing to the shrine. But to take it one step further, I'm about to do a fall damage cancel on the shrine, which saves some time by running off the wing and shield surfing. 
As soon as I get close to the shrine, I'm gonna go into a neutral dive and approach the shrine. And as soon as I'm in shrine distance, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do a jump attack to stall Link in the air, dive towards the shrine and cancel the dive. Like this. We have officially done a fall damage cancel and we can now enter Ascent. The Ascent Shrine is kind of boring, so I will skip over it. The only thing we do here that's interesting is that we get a bow in the shrine that we will use for the crazy movement that the Great Skyland has to offer now, starting from the Fuse Shrine. But that's pretty much all there is to say, so let's enter and I'll explain you the next cool strat. So right after Ascent, we come over here to the left and do a pretty unique looking throw. The reason for this throw will become apparent the second I actually do it. So I throw right here. I wait for a little bit. And what just happened is that I threw this specific capsule against a boat on the bottom here, standing next to... Uh, and you see the camera is getting a little bit crazy. Standing next to this construct, right? This will trigger the Maker Construct to give us the Energy Cell and we will receive the Energy Cell much faster here than normally. Because normally we will get this Energy Cell after completing the second shrine which takes longer because the Construct kind of points you towards the next location of interest where you can learn more about the Energy Cell and how to like build a boat and stuff. Another fancy little fall damage cancel here by um, grabbing onto this root allows us to enter the bottomless cave, which previously we would have entered from the bottom and then ran through to pick up a bunch of bomb flowers. These bomb flowers will be pretty crucial for the next part of the run as a shield serve towards fuse. Now here we do another one of those wing landings, but with a little bit of a small difference, we're gonna be duplicating a singular bomb as we land onto our wing and then fly straight to the fuse shrine. Now, normally what you can do on this wing is you can duplicate a bunch more bomb flowers. I will do this closer to the shrine as I explain some other intricacies of the run that are gonna be important if you wanna watch runs in the future. If you watch, for example, Player 5 right now, other top runners, like Lovely Series or the Series Challenges or Red Slay, they will probably scan an amiibo right there at the cold section, hoping to get a topaz. Now, I will also scan an amiibo here in a bit and retry it until I get this topaz to show you the fastest strats available because this topaz allows us to set up a glitch a little bit faster than without the topaz. Without the topaz, you would need four weapons, which is why I picked up the stick earlier, and a pretty intricate menu uh, glitch to set up something called Arrow Smuggle. Arrow Smuggle is our newest movement trick that we use in the game in these early versions to fly around. We're gonna be using it in Fuse to skip a cutscene. We're gonna be using it to fly all the way from Fuse to Ultra Hand later. So previously what runners would do is they would pick up this other tree branch, the tree branch we got earlier from the Room of Awakening, and then one more here and then enter Fuse. I will drop all of these because I will show you the fastest strats and scan some amiibo here in a second until I get a topaz. Another thing I wanted to explain is duplicating bombs. On version 1.0, if you try to duplicate a bunch of bombs at once, you will usually blow yourself up. For some reason, bombs work differently in this version than, for example, version 1.1. I think Player 5 recently made a video about the version, version differences, which is why you would normally see runners duplicating two bombs at most at once on that wing as they fly here. I will get myself up to six bombs, which is where I would usually be if I was doing a normal speed run. So I will make a cut here and basically scan a Amiibo until I get a topaz. You will see top runners, they will have eight of the same topaz. This is usually the uh, Amiibo. Yeah, this is usually the Daruk Amiibo. To get the topaz, I only have one of them, so I'm gonna have to retry this and I will basically continue this explanation of the cool tricks once I get the topaz. Um, but you will see in the future, runners will probably kill their runs here if they run the amiibo category. In no amiibo, you would just pick up the sticks and then grab a ruby uh, in this cave right here. Basically in between fuse and ascent, but I will show you the topaz strats and why it's fast in just a bit. Now this took about 10 attempts, which is pretty much what you would expect as a topaz is a 10% chance of spawning. Once again, top runners will actually have multiple Daruk amiibos available to them and will scan until they get the topaz. Now I will duplicate the topaz once, normally you would do that on the wing as you fly here. And then enter views where we will learn about the newest movement tag in Tears of the Kingdom speedruns. So the fuse shrine goes a little bit like this. We start off by dropping a bomb and fusing it to our shield and then run up towards the wall doing a shield jump and then as soon as the shield jump is kind of mid-air we take out five bombs, dupe them and go into a neutral dive where we pick up the bombs other than one. We then fuse that bomb onto our shield 
and then go into our menu to unfuse the dragon head from the shield I picked up earlier after Ascent. This will also equip this shield. We crouch dash, dash off this platform, which gives us a little bit of extra speed and pick up bows and arrows and then shoot a bomb arrow at the eye of the chest here, which will allow us uh, to basically pick up the key more efficiently as the chest flies towards us. On the way to the chest, we actually get rid of all of our arrows for the arrow smuggle trick uh, I keep talking about. This will make it so that we can efficiently move around with it and then pick up the key to open the <laughs> upcoming door. I will then put a bomb on the ground, which will automatically make our menu go to the bombs, do a shield jump and duplicate five bombs, which I can do here because we are on the water. Fuse one bomb to our shield and walk towards the door. Now we're doing a very complicated setup to get into the arrow smuggle flight. We start by opening up the door and then preparing to shock Link himself by sh shooting a topaz. Just before he gets shocked though, I pull out my bow by pressing ZR. I then drop my shock stick, turn Link around, unpause and pause the game. Now I will drop one of my bows, equip another, walk away with a bow stuck to my feet, drop another bow, equip another bow, unpause, pause, drop another bow. Now I have two bows stuck to my foot. I will then pick up the Topaz Broadsword again. And it's very important, I have currently two bows stuck on Link's feet. I can only pick up one of them, otherwise the glitch will not work uh, going towards the late game. I'm about to pick up one of them as I'm doing this next shield jump to skip the cutscene with the construct inside the shrine. This will be the first time you see the arrow smuggle flight movement. Watch this. <laughs> We just skipped the cutscene of the construct fight and we can leave this shrine now. You, st you still see this bow stuck to my feet. As soon as I press A here to examine the shrine, Link will smuggle this bow and the state where he's able to do these crazy jumps that you just saw everywhere in the game until he either dies or you reload a save file. This bow will be st basically smuggled to Link's back so I can take the state wherever I go in the game all the way to the final boss. In the future we might even use the strategy in the final boss fight. Now, normally, you would do a very intricate jump to set up the next arrow flight all the way over to the Ultra Hand Shrine. I instead will kind of show you how this bow works and how this arrow smuggle flying works for a little bit. And then I will go back into the shrine and set up the trick that allows us runners to go to Ultra Hand fast in the next clip. But I wanted to talk about arrow flying a little bit at first. So now you can see the bow is no longer stuck to Link's feet, but if I press the aiming button, you see that Link is pulling out an invisible bow. He's currently aiming with nothing in his hand. And this is what we're gonna use. Now, that alone wouldn't be useful, but what makes this powerful is that it allows us to cancel jump attacks quick. So for example, when I'm pulling out my bow and holding the shield button at the same time, and I jump, I can press Y to jump attack and then pull out my invisible bow again. So if I basically go back and forth between doing those jump attacks and aiming with our invisible bow again, we can kind of hop in the air, kind of skipping a little bit like this. Now why this is good is because it allows us to preserve our speed. So in this next clip I'm going to set up a very precise position with a bomb shield jump facing towards the ultra hand shrine. Doing the bomb shield jump onto the slope, which will blast us towards Ultra and quickly, and then using the arrow smuggle flying to preserve that momentum all the way to the shrine. Now, as you can see, Ultra Hand is a little bit higher than my current position, and we need to do this smuggle trick pretty quickly. The skipping I just showed, we have to do pretty quickly in quick succession. And it's actually so precise, I'm going to need some sort of metronome to be able to make it to the shrine without dying. Uh, and what I mean without dying, I don't want to be too low or I'll fall into the abyss. And I don't want to be too high or I'll take too much fall damage. So I will actually use some sort of metronome to make it from here to Ultra Hand. The way I will do this is by playing specific music. I actually have a specific song. So I'm going to set up now my music um, for the next section and I'll show you how this looks.
Once again, I'm about to start playing music, which kind of acts as a metronome for me to hit the trick consistently. I will now do four side hops to the left, two parries, aim at the shrine into another parry, and then here we go. You can see this trick is very precise, which is why I essentially wasn't able to talk at all because I had to focus exactly on the beat. You are not allowed to mute game audio here during speedruns, which kind of throws you off as well. Um, I could technically listen to the song on a different like headphones, but I wanted to show you the song. By the way, Margarita by Cloud Nun and Direct just sped up to 132 BP uh, BPM to exactly get this movement right. And obviously this looks super cool and it's very hype, but it is precise and can easily fail. But this is our first major use of arrow smuggle flying. You could see basically I used all of the crazy speed from the bomb jump and then used the arrow jumping to carry it all the way over here to the ultra entrance. From now on out, we're going to be using this jump all over the place. Once in ultra end, we immediately have another candidate for this jump. We're going to be positioning Link right here, aim specifically into the distance and then make sure that his left foot is barely on the slab and performing another instant shield jump. <laughs> With this speed, we can do a little bit of a more lax, kind of like relaxing arrow smuggle flying because we don't want Link to get too high here and carry the momentum all the way over. This one is not precise at all because the height doesn't really matter and we will reach the end of the shrine. Another nice use of arrow smuggle flying. So this next one is a bit spicy. After leaving the shrine here, we are going to be doing another one of those wing landings by doing a backflip and then landing onto a wing like this. After this material hitbox is over, we're going to run to the top of the wing, immediately do a neutral shield jump, and then use the arrow smuggle flying to make it to the door of Temple of Time. Like this. Now, once we open this door, we're going to get the recall power, then go to the door, go back to the recall shrine where the next arrow smuggle flying will be. So I'm going to just skip up ahead because you won't really be missing much until then. The arrow smuggle flight in recall is actually really cool because if you do it just fast enough, you'll be perfectly on the cycle to make it through the door. Let's see if we did it here. Boom. We moved just in time to be able to make it into the door here as the two hands overlap, making for a really clean cycle, allowing us to beat the recall shrine extremely quick. One cool strat some runners do after returning to Temple of Time with the same strategies once recall is beaten is a super jump. By shield surfing on this patch right here and then slowing Link down, you can equip a bomb shield, drop it and then press B and X in quick succession. You see how high I got with this bomb shield jump? By now spawning a wing, I can dive onto the wing and then take this wing over to the wheel to kind of save some extra maneuvering. Sometimes you could even make it all the way to the statue. From here, all that's left to do is essentially talk to the goddess statue, get to four hearts, open the door and finish the Great Sky Island, which kind of marks the real beginning, oh, that kind of marks the beginning of the late game of the run. I'm not super good at the late game, so in order to explain the strats in the late game efficiently, I'm going to pull up the current world record, which by the time of recording this video is by player 5, a 41 minute and 36 second time, and explaining the rest of the cool strats runners do to beat the game fast. Uh, so I'll see you after a little bit of a cut when we talk about the end game for the run. So after opening this door here and finishing the Great Sky Island, Player 5 will perform one more arrow smuggle flying jump by launching a wing and then jumping, shield jumping onto it, doing what I've explained to you the entire time, basically just to close out this gap to the end of the Great Sky Island. And you will then interact with this light uh, ball, essentially start playing again land on a wing and will make his way towards Hyrule Castle. He does something called wing duping here, where you dive off the wing to duplicate more of these topas very efficiently. This is basically so that you can... Normally, obviously, duping always loses time because you open up your inventory, making it so that the game is basically frozen. But in a little bit 
of that meantime where you go and collect the topazes from the ground again with this method this is more efficient because you're already moving towards the right direction you will then do a shield jump and use that shield jumps momentum to do more of those little arrow flights towards Hyrule Castle getting closer and closer and then one thing that's worth explaining here is that you can actually use the state of arrow smuggling to fall damage cancel. This is similar to the fall damage cancel that was found a long time ago where you cancel a jump slash. That's literally what Arrow Smuggle Flying does. He will basically line up here to make sure that he's at the balcony of Hyrule Castle, pull out his bow, and then the way this is done, and I will slow this down a little bit, is by doing the jump attack, diving, and then canceling your dive. You see, you see him dive here, then he's going to cancel the dive and he won't take any damage. He will now pick up some arrows again. This will make the out of bounds clips here a little bit easier. And line up Link on this wall with his right hand on the middle of this kind of like Triforce crest. Do three jumps up and perform the first clip out of bounds. We use the arrow smuggle flying once again to clip out of bounds here by letting go of the ceiling aiming and basically keep pressing the jump attack button you can actually see his input display here he's going to keep pressing y this is what i've been doing and then as soon as he is high up enough he's going to do a shield jump which will clip him out of bounds it looks like he may have lost a little bit of time here in his current record uh, he did actually get a topaz very first try in this run which is why another reason this run is so incredibly fast other than player five's incredible skill then he's going to walk upright and jump out of bounds into Hyrule Castle. This out of bounds mode is pretty cool, so I want to show you it. Um, you can basically dive straight down into the army by maneuvering through that section that normal players will run down to get to the final boss fight of the game, dodging these routes specifically. And then once you get closer to where the normal beginning of the army is, he's going to perform one more fall damage cancel using the same strategies as previously to land right here. Now from here what he's going to do is he switches to recall which is going to be needed for the army fight as we can cancel our main version of dealing damage which is throwing gemstones a little bit more efficiently and then removes his shield. This will make it so that Link ragdolls like this. This is the classic Link ragdolling animation. Link being in this ragdoll animation is going to allow him to clip through this wall again. There's technically a wall here from the other side. By doing this, he's going to clip in once again into bounce and he will be able to do the army fight right now. He's going to do one more fall damage cancel because it's actually faster to land up here to trigger the army fight even faster and will then begin the army fight. The army fight is a very technical section of the run because every single missed throw here will kill Link. What you want to do here is you want to make sure that you Press recall just after throwing these gemstones, which will automatically um, allow Link to throw another gemstone again. So at this point, he's just going to be spamming throws, cancel them with recall as soon as the throws go out, making sure that he doesn't die. The entire army fight is pretty much exactly this, with some interesting items that he picks up. He picks up a boss Bokoblin horn, he picks up a royal halberd, um, in fact two royal halberds to set up the damage that we do to uh, kill Ganon. He almost died there, thankfully you don't take damage in the moblin section. And he also picked up a black Lizalfos horn. From here, he's gonna go down to the left side of the army and perform another clip using the same strategies after doing something called zuggling. Zuggling has been in the game for a long time. This is essentially a trick where you stack weapons on top of each other to do absurd damage. He then fuses the black boss Boko Horn to this weapon. This zuggled stacked weapon will allow us to kill Ganondorf in essentially one shot per face. Also keep in mind the language is Russian here because Russian is fastest. He will perform one more of these arrow smuggle flying clips right here to make it past the boss wall. It's worth to note that you can actually not skip the army fight with the same strategy. The Ganondorf boss fight trigger won't be active until essentially you have beaten the army fight. Now then when the boss is spawned for some reason, the developers didn't really think about this and you can clip out of bounds and actually reach the Ganondorf fight. He's going to do one more of these clips to make it behind the big red wall and then go into a very specific position to set up one last arrow fly. 
By doing a bomb jump right here, uh, he's going to be blasted towards third. Ganondorf, making sure that he has no stamina when he does this. If he had any stamina at this point, he would go into bullet time every time he pulls out his bow because he actually has arrows again this time around. That helped him to do the clips earlier more efficiently. So he intentionally ran out of stamina to once again use the same strategy that I've been telling you about this entire video to make it to Ganondorf. Ganondorf itself is super easy. Um, with this suggled weapon stack that you can kind of see in Link's hand right here, you absolutely demolish him. A single flurry rush per yeah, face will kill him, as you can see here. You do the same thing in phase two. And then you do the same thing in phase three. Which is slow. Category eight. And Ganondorf is dead. From this point out, the last strategy remaining is the Demon Dra uh, Dragon 2 cycle, Second which is three, also yeah. pretty cool to look at, and one of the most tense sections in a run. After obtaining the Master Sword, which is obviously something that always oh, happens in every single run, yeah. Player 5 is going to jump off Zelda immediately here by... Uh, spamming X and then do some of these Mostor Slashes. Four Mostor Slashes while, I think it's actually five, while facing towards kind of the Colosseum in the back of the Great Plateau. He then drops the Zuggled Weapon Stack and switches back to the Master Sword to make his damage at the Demon Dragon weak points consistent. Lands next to the eye and hits it three times. And positions him four times, sorry, three times will happen soon. Why uh, he positions himself in this corner. This this eye is about to blast him up into the sky. He goes into a dive and then spawns a wing. Now he's gonna hold forward to land on the wing and place his Lesalfos horn on the wing that he then fuses to the Master Sword. This incre increases the Master Sword's damage, making dealing damage to Demon Dragon more efficient, scary, allowing us to go for the fast two cycle. He was a little bit slow there, so he was a little bit scared about this. He's gonna jump to eye number two, hit it quickly, and then jump off. This was cycle number one. We've already killed two of Demon Dragon's eyes. He is he's he knows that he's fine here nope. by looking at Zelda's position. This is important Blinking for the next part of the trick. Of the now you wait until Zelda takes you up, jump down, and dive perfectly to the third eye. Kill eye number three and walk up to the right, get blasted up once again, and land on another wing. Take this wing over to eye number four, which you can also three shot with this powered up master sword, and then do a chain of backwards monster slashes towards the center of this fight. This is where Zelda will pick you up once again, carrying you up to the head of Demon Dragon, allowing you to beat the game. Now, one important thing to note here is that player five is gonna do some hits on the secret stone here, and for the last hit, he is going to jump away and fire a beam into Demon Dragon Secret Stone. This will allow him to be mid-air when he does the final hit on him, making this next black screen here much faster. Oh, that's definitely a fake gold. He is uh, excited about potentially going too fast here compared to his normal splits. This black screen, if you are not mid-air, can actually take oh, seven that. seconds, so you get that fast transition if you are mid-air during that last hit. And that's pretty much the late game of Tears of the Kingdom. And with that, all that is left to do is to finish the run. With the Topaz Amiibo strats that I mentioned and one or two new discoveries, the movement and tricks for this run are finally getting really cool and probably fast enough to soon beat the game in under 40 minutes. To see that happen live, you should probably follow Player 5's channel. But I'm trying to break into the top 10 myself again on twitch.tv slash limcube. So if you want to see all of these tricks, that you obviously all understand now, live, come over. I also recently may have discovered the most fun way to replay and speedrun Tears of the Kingdom and will make a video about that one soon. But if you want to know what that is early, you can probably already catch me do it on my live stream as well. Ah, uh, yeah, and sorry for the lack of uploads recently. Tears of the Kingdom as a speed game didn't really click with me last year, but with all of these new tricks and ways to play the game, I'm actually really excited to upload a bunch of videos on ideas I'm working on, so if you want to see them first, make sure to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.